just let me know. Uh, so guys, welcome to Legal Considerations with Structure Your Deal. Uh, my presumption here is that the vast majority of the people on this call are, smoke them if you got them, that's right. Uh, the, the vast majority of the people on this call are looking to buy a business, have bought a business, SMB operators. Um, and so we're talking today about considerations when structuring that acquisition. Um, my name is Eric Pasifici. I run a law firm called SMB Law Group. Um, we kicked off in July of last year. I was um, at a law firm called Kirkland and Ellis, which is a large global law firm that specializes in private equity, doing $100 million, billion dollar deals, um, and saw that there was an opportunity in the small business space to create a law firm specifically designed for small business buyers and operators um, and sellers as well. Um, and so wrangled up a few really great partners. I have a partner in Dallas. Um, somebody mentioned they were in Dallas named Kevin Henderson, um, who, uh, I worked with at a large law firm. He was in house. Great, uh, great lawyer. Um, and then our third partner, Sam Rosati, who was in Tampa, Florida is in Tampa, Florida. And Sam's a lawyer by training, went to UVA law school. And then after a couple of years of, of practicing law, he realized that being on your side of the table is actually the better place to be. And so Sam, um, started buying and investing in businesses and has bought and invested in a number of businesses. And I, I, he's part of the conference as well. So Sam was separately speaking um, on behalf of, I believe, his, his private equity fund called Pursuant Capital. We wanted to create a law firm, guys, designed specifically for um, you in that we have business uh, acumen on our team. We've got experienced transactional um, folks on our team as well. And so um, that's what we've done. We did 28 deals in the second half of last year. And we've done probably in the neighborhood of that many th this year so far. So very active space. We've seen a lot across um, small business M&A. We've seen a lot of different U.S. SBA lenders, the way that they operate, the way they think about things, their requirements. Um, we've seen a lot of sellers and seller lawyers in other states, which come in different caliber quality you know you've got your you run your gamut from folks who are up market that are accustomed to 50 100 million dollar deals that make a total mess of these transactions and you know really push i think entirely too hard uh, and then you've got folks that are down market that don't have business buying or m a experience that don't know terms and really quite frankly oftentimes don't represent sellers very well they can make a mess of things as well, not as much as the upmarket guys do, believe it or not. But, um, you know, th they're rubber stamping things and not really making sure that you as buyer or seller is getting the most out of it. And yeah, Sam was live yesterday, so um, I'll have to watch his se session. I feel like every time Sam talks, I, I learn. Um, so, guys, I'm going to dive in and the chat is open. If anybody wants to um, ask any specific questions, take this conversation in any direction. I'll do my best to field questions. So feel free. Um, let's begin with the LOI and structuring your transaction, right? The first step in buying a business, and I'm going to focus on the legal stuff, guys, right? The procedural stuff, the negotiation with the broker, um, you know, how that happens, you know, it's really, it's business stuff. It's negotiation stuff. It's not really legal, although we're there alongside you in those, those, um, stages, but it's really, it's, it's, um, the legal stuff that I'm going to focus on. And so at the first stage, you have your letter of, of intent and Nunzio, I don't know if it's possible to share my screen and I could pull up a, a, a letter of intent. If it's not, I can just kind of, uh, walk through it, but, um, he says it is possible. Um, is that, let's see, where, where would that be located? Box with the arrow. Um, so I don't know that I have a box with an arrow right below your video. Yeah, so I've got enable captions, mute audio, mute video, open share menu. Is that the share? Oh, share screen. Okay. Um, and I don't want to, yeah, okay. So here is our letter of intent. Okay, awesome. Can you guys see this? Got it. Okay. Um, great. So this is our SMB Law Group form letter of intent. I, I believe it, at this point, somewhere in the neighborhood of more than 100 transactions have been um, entered into on this form. And we really try to keep it simple for our buyers and create a paint by numbers setup. That being said, you know, this is your deal. 
and as I mentioned a moment ago, it's not legal, but the business stuff, you know, you're welcome to rewrite your LOI and write an LOI in any shape, you know, form, structure, you want to write it, you know, put the nice stuff up front, tell the seller how you're really, you know, honored to have the opportunity to buy their business and you respect what they've built and yada, yada. And um, yeah, and, and thanks, Nunzio. So I'm SMB attorney on Twitter um, at uh, small, medium business underscore attorney on Twitter. So i um, happy to connect with folks on there um, as well. I think about business buying 22 hours a day, drive my wife crazy with it. So always happy to talk to you guys if you have questions or want to ask questions um, as well. But back to the other line. So the first step is deciding how do you want to structure this deal? Do you want to buy the assets of the business? 22 hours. Yeah, it's it's, it's about right. 22 hours is, is about right some days. But um, do you want to buy the assets of the business or do you want to buy the stock of the business? Do you want to buy the stuff that the business has or do you want to buy the whole business? Okay. And the baseline expectation in small business acquisitions and what you should always strive to do is just buy the assets, just buy the stuff of the business. And the reason why is if you buy the whole business and you actually take the equity or the stock, you take all of the historical liabilities with it, which means you take all the dumb things or maybe not dumb things, but things that have resulted in potential liability to the company that the seller has done, you take it all with you, right? So if he's ever or she has ever done anything that's resulted in a potential lawsuit, employment issues, um, on and on, you could potentially take that with you, which is a huge risk, right? And I think about these small business deals, guys, I focus on sub $20, $20 million M&A now. And when you're talking about a $5 million deal or $5 million enterprise value company, you're going to see some of the same legal risks that you would see with a $50 million business, right? Tax issues, litigation issues. You know, let's, let's say you're installing pools. We had a pool installation company recently, very litigious business. Okay. And you screw up a pool installation. You can, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to, um, we'll get to indemnity Nancy, in just a, a few minutes. We'll work our way there. Um, if you screw up a pool installation and it results in $10 million in damages to somebody's home, you're going to get sued for that the same way you would get sued for 10 million bucks with a $50 million deal. So anyways, the, the magnitude of the potential liability to me is still very high, but you're talking about a small business that is not going to be able to absorb that blow. A $50 million business may be able to absorb the blow. A $5 million business is not. So if you start out with a baseline in your deal of buying only the assets, you don't take any of that historical stuff with, with you. Save for a few exceptions. Some states in the U.S. have very aggressive environmental employment um, and tax issues. Interested in substance abuse treatment? Any thoughts? You know, I, I'm not going to dive into specific types of businesses today just because I don't think that that's – we could talk off on the side, but – I don't think that that's going to be helpful to the to the crowd. Um, and there's a, there's enough just general stuff to cover. But that's a good question, uh, Paul. Um, and so if we buy just the assets, we don't take any of that stuff with us. So we want to start with that. You also, in an asset, you'll get better tax treatment than if you buy the stock. If you buy the so stock, yeah, no problem. Um, you buy the stock, you take the existing depreciation schedule of the business, meaning and I'm not a tax lawyer or a tax expert, but the point being is depreciation in a business is very important. It allows you to write off income or reduce your taxable income in the years after the acquisition, which makes it a more lucrative acquisition for you. If you buy the existing stock of the business, you take the existing depreciation schedule. And in most instances, these business owners being rational individuals have taken a lot of depreciation. And if they've done that, then you don't have as much depreciation post-closing to reduce your taxable income. Business is less valuable. In an asset deal, you apply the purchase price across all of the assets in an allocation that's agreed to, which gives you better tax treatment. And you're able to try to apply more to tangible things like equipment um, that has a better depreciation schedule than Goodwill. 
Um, and so always want to start with that asset deal. This LOI template, guys, is um, our asset deal template. Um, there will be instances very quickly where a stock deal may make more sense, right? If you have issues um, assigning the assets of the business, because in the asset deal, you have to assign all of those assets to you from the seller. Now, some of those assets may not be assignable, right? Like a lot of these businesses that you're going to find in the small business space are service businesses. They don't have anything. They don't have any stuff, right? All they have is contracts, goodwill, their name and employees, relationships, right? So it's a lot of, it's a lot of gray area. You, it, it's, it's very common that contracts may not be assignable. And if they're important contracts, like for example, we had a physical therapy clinic two months ago and they had a number of payor contracts from insurance companies. The vast majority of their revenue was being paid by the insurance companies. The seller for good reason did not want to go to the insurance companies and ask for those contracts to be assigned because his understanding of the marketplace was one, those insurance companies have a, a high likelihood of reevaluating and saying that they're actually going to, you know, give the work to other places. And so seller was nervous to do it. So he didn't want to do it pre-closing. But the problem buyer had was, well, if I buy this business and it turns out that those payor contracts are not assignable, my revenue immediately drops 75% or could, which blows up my whole deal. And so we had to flip to a stock purchase to buy the business and assume those contracts because we bought the whole business. Now, sometimes you'll have change of control issues in those contracts as well. If it's a stock purchase that will prevent you from buying, uh, you know, that will make you do stuff as well. So it's not always perfect, but always want to start with the asset acquisition. Uh, this is our, our template LOI. It covers off, I think, the majority of the key issues in these deals. Now, the first of which is purchase price, right? This is very simple. Purchase price is purchase price, you know, how much you're going to pay for the business, but it can be sliced and diced in a number of ways. You know, purchase price is always going to be a multiple of earnings. Some folks d disagree with me or, or, you know, more often than not, I don't know how you guys value businesses, but typically you're, you're going to take a multiple of the earnings of the business and that's what you pay for. I like to have this in here, guys, because we've had a robust discussion or debate recently in, in, a, in the small business buying community about retrading versus renegotiating, right? Retrading having, having a negative connotation to it, meaning you changing the terms of the deal after you've inked an LOI because you no longer like them in the absence of new information. Renegotiating happens in every deal because you're not buying a house, right? Buying real estate is much easier. You've got a building, you have an inspection to make sure that there aren't really any typical issues, foundation issues, roof issues, whatever. It's it's not as dynamic as a business. A business is incredibly dynamic. There's a lot under the hood once you get the chance to lift it and you don't typically get to lift that hood at the LOI stage. Um, can we get links to slides specifically the sample LOI? Yeah, I can provide the sample LOI, Richard, if, it, if it'd be helpful to you guys. Um, um, and so I like to have this in here, right? Because you go do quality of earnings. I'm a big proponent of doing financial diligence and quality of earnings. You go do quality of earnings, and it turns out that they've been running $60,000 in what should be um, you know, losses of the business or liabilities or whatever uh, through personal credit cards on the side. Right. This is stuff we see. It makes the PL look really nice, but now we got to add that back. Well, if you've laid out what the earnings multiple is here in the LOI and established that baseline and said, hey, I'm paying you three and a half for this business, if the earnings come down, excuse me, in the financial diligence, then you've established the, the basis to go back to them and say, hey, guys, I, I told you I was going to pay you three and a half. It's right here in the LOI. And three and a half, we thought it was a million bucks, but you've been running 60,000 bucks through credit cards. So now it's, 800,000. So three and a half times 800,000 is a different number. This shouldn't be, you know, surprising to you, right? So you want to set the stage in the LOI by doing things like this. Now, 
we're slicing and dicing between what happens if multiple has to change the result of reduction of earnings. Yeah, that that's uh, so multiple. I don't think the multiple would ever be affected, right? Multiple is, and I'm not a valuation expert. This is a little non-legal, but multiples are typically predicated on the industry that you're in and kind of what's happening generally in the marketplace. Although it's, I think it's more of an art than it is a science, but um, I think the earnings would change. The multiple probably doesn't change. Um, promissory notes. Guys, you're going to want promissory notes in all of your deals. I do what my clients tell me to do, right? If they don't think a promissory note is necessary or negotiate a prom out a promissory note, then I'm not, I'm not their dad, right? And as long as I've thoroughly communicated the legal concerns, then they can do what they want. But I'm a massive proponent of promissory notes. And there are certain lenders too that won't even lend without a promissory note because you the only way, the only meaningful way for sellers to have any screws to them in these deals is through the promissory note. I'll give you an example. Imagine a scenario where you buy a business and six months in you're fumbling the bag, right? You've paid $3 million for the business. 500,000 of that is tied to a seller's note. Um, and you are in over your head. You haven't negotiated consulting services. So seller doesn't have any contractual reason to come back and help you. You go to the seller and you say, Hey, I need your help. Are they going to do it? Are they going to have any reason to do it if you've paid them 100% cash up front? The answer is emphatically that they're not. Now, they may still do it if they're good people and they're concerned about their legacy, but they're not going to have the same motivation as if you went to them and said, hey, I'm in over my head. I'm not going to be able to pay your note, your $500,000 note, if you don't get in here and help me sort this out. So you always want to have that in there. I personally would recommend not doing a deal without a seller's note. The seller's note can also work as a backstop, rollover equity. Sorry, my screen, it just went out here. So I'm going to try to keep talking, but my screen actually just went out, guys. Um, bear with me for just a second. All right, we're back. We're live. Um, sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know what it was. It just went out randomly. Um, so rollover equity in lieu of a promissory note. Yes, in SBA land, you can't have rollover equity. You can't have earnouts. So I'm really talking about kind of SBA land. Um, but sure, if you've got rollover equity, then yeah, they, they own a piece of the business. If it's going under, that's a problem. So you want to make sure you've got something in there to put screws to them. Um, and Promissory notes too, also in small business, they're oftentimes used as a backstop to the indemnity. And so um, in mid-market or up-market M&A, you'll have an escrow to support your indemnity. And I'll tell you what indemnity is here in a few minutes if you don't know. Um, but the promissory note is an easier means to say, hey, if I have any indemnity claims, I'm going to reduce them from the promissory note instead of... Um, you know, ha asking you to set aside cash for some period of time. So they're helpful for that instance as well. Um, and then guys, additional terms. In the LOI, you could spell out really anything that needs to be a condition to your closing. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff and I, I, I missed hitting on this when I was talking about the asset purchase, but the assignment of licenses, right? A lot of these businesses have really important licenses that you need to get in order to be able to operate the business or the business already has it and it needs to be assigned. And uh, you know, you're gonna want to make sure that the assignment of those licensures or the the um, obtaining those licenses is um, is done before you're forced to close the deal. Or if there's a key employee, right? There's a key employee that, that's in place and um, you wanna make sure you've got an employment agreement in place with them before you are forced to close, things like that. So think about that kind of thing. Non-compete. Non-compete is so critical in these deals, guys. Um, the sell, just, let's just establish a baseline on non-competes. If the seller goes out and competes with you, you buy the business, they go across the street the next day. They've got their couple million dollar war chest that you've just given them. They say, I'm going to compete with you. 
they're going to use that couple million dollars. They've got all the relationships with the employees. They've got all the relationships with the customers. They know the marketplace. They know how to run the business. They get to start over from scratch and run a new business that, you know, that doesn't have all the warts and, you know, issues that they've developed in their business over the years. They're going to crush you. They're going to put you out of business. Okay. So one issue we've run into in a recent transaction is sellers trying, well, transactions generally. This one is a red flag, guys. If people are pushing back on the non-compete, whether it's the scope of the non-compete geographically, the number of years, you know, five years is, is the right amount of time. If you're selling me your business and you're saying, I'm getting out of this business, then what do you care what the non-compete says? I need to know that for five years, you're going to stay out because even three years, right? Three years puts them in a position where they take a one year vacation, they rest up, they do a really nice cruise. They spend a year, uh, you know, beefing up. And then, you know, the, the first day, the three year and first day mark, they come back into the marketplace and they crush you like they would have three years prior. You need five years to get comfortable and yeah, they're tired of playing golf. They're ready to get back to work. You know, they're juiced and they've got them, you know, the couple million dollar, whatever it is, war chest that you gave them to do it. So non-compete, don't play games with the non-compete. If they're pushing back on non-compete. So not, so let's, let's be clear about non-competes too. There's two different avenues for non-competes. Business sale non-competes are not the same as employment non-competes. Employment non-competes are more negatively viewed under the law, particularly in places like California. The FTC's ban on non-competes is not going to affect business sale non-competes. Because, think about it, guys. If, If you had to make a several million dollar investment into a business, but the FTC or the state of California was telling you that you couldn't bar the seller from competing with you, you, you'd be absolutely out of your mind for making that investment and they would kill small business M&A in the process. And so that's never going to be the case. Um, but non-competes are not an area to, to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to allow any, any, any breathing room for them. Transition services. So I think about these businesses, these small businesses as being almost always intertwined with the seller, right? It would be great to go out there and find a business that really is a true business and runs on its own. And they do exist, right? You're going to pay a pretty penny for them. But the vast majority of these businesses are really directly tied to the seller. And so the seller needs to agree, I think, if I'm going to buy a business, I want the seller in the passenger seat for a meaningful period of time helping me transition that business. And to the extent it doesn't go well because they don't play ball or they go on a cruise and they don't come back, I again want the ability to go after that seller for indemnity and ding the promissory note and try to inflict some pain to make them do what they're supposed to do. Because if you give a 70 year old 5 million bucks and how likely is that individual to come and help you run a business that they know everything about, you know, nothing about. And so you really need to have some, some screws to them with transition services. You also, you know, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see buyers make is, they're reluctant to ask for enough consulting or transition services. The SBA will allow you up to a full year. Ask for a full year. Now give yourself the optionality. If the person turns out to be, you know, and this is gonna, this isn't gonna play well. I hope this isn't recorded, but you know, super boomer from hell that's walking up and down the hallway, pontificating and trying to undermine you and yelling at employees, have the ability to fire them, but don't have that, don't give them the ability to walk off. Um before the 365th day, if you don't want them to try for that, flatter them, tell them, Hey, I respect what you've built. I would love to have the opportunity to learn from you. I would love to have you stay on board. Oftentimes these sellers are not necessarily ready to retire and stop doing the work. They are sick of managing a whole business and having entrepreneurship be 
their whole life because it is very all consuming. Um, but they're not necessarily wanting to, you know, hand you the keys and take off. Some of them are right, but not all of them. And so ask for more than you, you think that you need, assuming of course, that you can support it in your models and that you can support their salary or whatever hourly cost, but ask for more transition services. Um, you know, we've got some, some miscellaneous stuff in the LOI that we don't need to spend a ton of time talking about, but I do want to talk about exclusivity. Nunzio, how much time do I have? 45 minutes or an hour? See there? 12.55. Okay. All right. So I got another 30 minutes. No, if I can, if I can, I can talk about business buying all day long. Um, um, so exclusivity. Um, this is another one, guys, that if you get pushback on exclusivity, it's a it's it's not as red of a flag as a non-compete, but it's a red flag. Um, yeah, I could go for six hours, Paul. Don't don't push me. We could uh, we'll just Nunzi will set up a side thing. I'll just keep talking. Um, the SBA process, if you're using SBA lending, is going to be a sixty to ninety day process. Give yourself the right to negotiate for a hundred days to start exclusively sellers push back on this and their lawyers push back on this and they don't appreciate that you have real meaningful costs um, associated with the business buying process, right? You have to go out and first of all, it's a ton of time. Many of you are probably working jobs, right? So you've got jobs, you've got a wife or husband, you've got kids, you've got a life going on. And you're dedicating an enormous amount of time to this if you do it right. Financial diligence. I'm a big proponent of quality of earnings. We have we work with some of the best quality of earnings providers in the space. They're going to be somewhere between, and I, I don't want to throw numbers out there because I guess I don't really know, but you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 20,000 bucks to have a QOE provider financially diligence your business. You have legal costs, right? You got to hire a lawyer to, to paper it up. And then you've got all kinds of other miscellaneous expenses in your search. The absolute last thing you guys can do is work on a deal for 60 days, have a list of expenses, and then have the buyer have the unfettered right to sell to anybody off the street that comes in with a higher price because they will. And if you give a mouse a cookie with exclusivity, I always say, if you give the mouse a cookie, the ch the kid's book, I've got two kids, sorry for the analogy, but they're going to ask for a glass of milk. Um, so break fees in these are tough, right? Oftentimes the seller is going to ask for a deposit and that's not a an M&A construct, guys, right? That's a creature of the main street m a world that is a conflation with real estate that a lot of these brokers are primarily real estate people or only have experience with real estate so they want you to put up a deposit when you at the loi stage you have to be pragmatic with brokers um yeah and you you can right you can ask for a reciprocal deposit but you have to be pragmatic with these brokers and so I'm always fine with my clients putting up a deposit so long as it is refundable no matter what. The deposit is there to signal to the buy, the seller that I'm serious. I'm putting 10, 20, 50,000 bucks into an account. You know I'm not messing around as a result of that. But these transactions are incredibly dynamic. And so if this does not happen for any reason, after I open the hood and find out what I'm actually buying, if I don't even like it, I, I have to have the right to get that money back in full without any questions because otherwise it flips the leverage position you feel like you've got a a a gun to your head down the stretch and you do not want to have a gun to your head when you're trying to make a sober unemotional financial decision that is almost always for all of us on this going to be the largest financial decision of our lives and so having a deposit in place is not a great idea um a lot of deals break down after LOI, right? Deal, deal, most deals die at two stages. They either die 
in the financial diligence stage early on, you, you lift the hood and you go, oh shit, there's a lot of, excuse my language, but there's a lot under the hood here that I didn't realize and I want out. Or at the very end, they have a tendency to blow up spectacularly at the end. Sellers are always talking nice early on. And then you get down the stretch. Everybody's tired. Ton of deal fatigue, right? We're 80 days in. The sellers have never done this before. And they feel almost always like they're the victim of some sort of, you know, highway robbery. Things get tense. And so, and, and I actually sympathize, right? Because a lot of times the SBA process is, I always say it's like getting a mortgage from the DMV. It is a gigantic pain in the butt. Great, great debt. And the whole marketplace wouldn't exist. And the value of American small businesses would be a lot lower without the SBA. But it is like getting a mortgage from the DMV. You are getting money from the federal government. Now, the money is coming from private institutions, banks, but they're trying to all look at the SBA standard operating procedure guide and draw their own, which is, I don't even know, guys, it's hundreds of pages long. And they're all trying to draw different conclusions about the SOPs and what this means and what that means. And there was one a couple months ago that as one kind of funny example, the SOPs say that you can't lend, the SBA cannot lend to a discriminatory business, right? For Civil Rights Act purposes, if a business excludes somebody based on sex or race or whatever, you know, the protected classes, then they will not lend on that business. And for good reason, right? If you've got a country club that is excluding women, then no, you should not be getting money from the U.S. federal government for the sale of that business. However, the lender, and it wasn't the lender, it was their lawyer, because the, len the lenders have outside lawyers as well. And those lawyers come in different shapes and sizes and qualities, decided that an e-commerce business that was selling products designed for women, right? It was like women's products was a discriminatory business, which I hope all 88 people on this call right now can appreciate that if I choose to sell, you know, shampoo designed for men, I'm not discriminating against women, right? They, women can buy the product if they want to. It's just, it's marketed to men, right? Um, and so, uh, so you, you run into crazy stuff like that. And these deals have a tendency to die as a result of silly things like that. Um, and so you want to, in the exclusivity provision, give yourself the opportunity. I'm going to come back to exclusivity now. Give yourself the right to um, negotiate this business exclusively without worrying about somebody coming off the street and undercutting you after you've put in a, t a ton of time, a ton of money. And for most of us, we're trying to buy a business because... The vast majority of my clients, right, are 25 to 50 year old people that have a couple kids, a spouse, have been killing themselves in corporate for a long time. They want to do something different with their life. This is a big moment in their life. They're not only investing money and time, but emotional capital. They're trying to figure out like, okay, I live in Plano, Texas, but I'm buying a business in Concord, North Carolina. I got three kids in school. I got to move them to North Carolina. I got to figure all this out. And I, I'm supposed to do that without ex, the r exclusive right to, yeah, manscaped tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm supposed to do that without the exclusive right to negotiate this business. I, I can't do it, right? Like I just cannot put myself, my family, my financial situation through this transaction without that exclusivity. I'll go find another business, right? I'll go find a seller who is committed and that I trust because I've seen crazy stuff, right? We had an LOI negotiation, plenty of sellers in the seat. There really is. You don't need to feel once you get into this, a buying situation that you're desperate to get the deal done. The moment you get desperate or you get emotional, you lose that unemotional investment, you know, clarity in the transaction is when you can potentially start making mistakes. The exclusivity gives you that comfort to sleep at night, knowing you don't have to rush through anything. Um, you know, breakup fees and that I've seen some people try to put in breakup fees where they tell the seller, hey, if you violate the exclusivity, it's twenty five thousand bucks punitive damages. You could try for that. You can ask for it. There's no magic to an LOI. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. It's typically a pretty tough ask, though. Um, so that's exclusivity. And, you know, th the rest of this is pretty much is what it is. 
happy to entertain any questions on the LOI in the comment section. Uh, but otherwise, the, the only thing I'd say overall on LOIs is that you want these to be non-binding, right? You want the LOI to, there should be only a few things, except as specifically set forth in paragraph 13. And paragraph 13 lists, um, well, I'd actually, sorry, that's a, that's a boss. We'll fix that. Paragraphs 9 through 17 are binding. So, you know, the way that they have to run the business after you're under, un, under LOI, so they don't run it into the ground. The exclusivity, the confidentiality, the expenses provision. You pay your expenses, they pay their expenses, period. Um, the termination of it and then the miscellaneous stuff about what state it's governed by um, should be binding. Everything else, purchase price, um, promissory notes, all the stuff up above is not, you know, transition services, non-compete. None of that's binding. If if the deal breaks down, you cannot sue them and they cannot sue you to try to say, hey, you have to sell me this business pursuant to these terms because you agree to this LOI or vice versa, where they say you have to buy this business at this price because you agree to it in the LOI. That doesn't make any sense. Um, Ted said, what if broker is marketing? Oh, this is moving faster. What if broker is marketing company while seller is under LOI? Yeah, they, they shouldn't be, right? You want the exclusivity language, Ted, to say, take the the uh, the business off the website. You're not allowed to talk to anybody. You're not allowed to encourage anybody. You're not allowed to continue any negotiations you've had. You're not allowed to do it indirectly. Your employees aren't allowed to do it. Your affiliates aren't allowed to do it. You're not allowed to do say a, a word about this business to anybody else during the LOI. They'll want to get cute with it. Well, we're going to take backup offers. No, you're not. Because if you're taking backup offers, you think that there's a universe in which you're not going to dog whistle that to the seller. You know what I mean? You, you, and, and guys, this is already so tough to police in the first place. We had one back in September. I signed an LOI. One of my, my a client of mine signs an LOI for a business. Two weeks later, I'm in a partner meeting in my firm. And one of the partner goes, hey, I had a consult today for XYZ business. The business we're under LOI for. Before I could even say anything, my other partner goes, oh, no way. He goes, I actually just had somebody else inquire about that business as well. And they did a site visit this week. And I chime in. I go, guys, we have a buyer who is under LOI for that business right now. You're telling me that the seller's been doing site visits? Like they're openly violating the NDA or the LOI, the exclusivity. And so, you know, we don't want to blow the deal up for the buyer. Although, honestly, when you see a situation like that, like you guys want to buy a business from a good person. If they're doing those kinds of things, they're not a good person. So that is a massive red flag in the first place. But we decided that we weren't going to go crazy. We reach out to the seller, send him a nice letter saying, hey, looking forward to working with you. We understand X, Y, Z and ha happened. We know directly that you breached the exclusivity and cut it out. And we're looking forward to working with you. The next day we get back a crazy overwritten demand letter from a litigation firm that they went out and hired saying they didn't breach LOI and yada, yada. Look at this language, which just is not a coherent legal argument, but that's what litigators do. And basically sue us if you think, you know, if you think you could prove it. And we could have proved it. Guys, in that instance, we had direct evidence that they were violating the LOI, the exclusivity. But the problem is, what are we going to sue them for at that stage, right? We're going to sue them for our client's damages at that stage, which are about, he had put down a commitment with a, a lender for about 10,000 bucks. So... We're going to go sue them in court for 10,000 bucks when we got to hire a litigator to do, to do that. That's probably going to charge that much to even write a demand. Like we're just left without a paddle, right? So the LO, the exclusivity is already so difficult to enforce in the first place that if you got the mouse asking for a cookie and saying, Hey, we're going to take backup offers and we're going to do all these things. You can't entertain it, right? You, 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 you just can't. Um, I'm going to read through what recourse do you have if the part of the agreement Requires the seller to stay on this is the transition on day one. They decide to be dead weight. Yeah, you, you should. If, if, if a seller agrees to transition services and you have a consulting agreement saying that they're going to do whatever and they don't do it, then they're breaching a covenant under the purchase agreement and you should be able to seek indemnification against them for those damages. And 
that's something you guys should push really hard for because the the message is I'm not buying a $50 million business that runs on its own. I'm buying a $7 million business that is directly intertwined with these sellers. And so if they walk off on day one or go on a cruise and don't come back, my investment could go to zero. And I can't, I can't have that. Um, what time frame for non-solicitation of employees? Same as non-compete. That should be five years, right? If they're not, guys, if they're selling you a business and saying, hey, Eric, I'm out of this business, then get out of the business. What do you need to solicit my employees for? even for a different venture, right? Because that hurts my valuation. If you're going to come take all my best people to go, you know, you're selling me an art gallery and you're going to go open a yacht company, whatever, like, but you take all my best people, all of a sudden that's a big problem. Um, have you ever seen an uptick in reps and warranties? So there is a uh, rep and warranty provider called CFC that does a small business policy. Um, no, sell side brokers cannot, they have their own form, right? And they'll all tell you, this is the standard form, Nunzio. We've never done it on any other form. And this isn't my first rodeo. I've done 4,000 of these on this form. And this is standard. There's no such thing as a standard LOI, guys. And all they're trying to do is just put screws to you. And, and, and their broker forms are oftentimes terrible. And their purchase agreements, they want you to sign a purchase agreement up front that's structured more like, and my, my lawn care team just showed up, so sorry, guys. Um, structured more like a real estate purchase than a business purchase. And um, you more often than not, these will be seven pages and they want to keep it simple, right? These will be about seven pages long. About four of the pages will be designed to protect the broker. You know, all this crazy stuff that is not ever market in any deal. They're not even a party to the transaction. They're just facilitating it. And you guys get three pages and they get four. You know, you're releasing them of every conceivable liability. That stuff is garbage. And if you have to play nice, I've had some buyers use those forms in, in, in the past. If you have to play nice to get a deal done, you really want to buy the business, then you can do that, right? But that's not what quality, sophisticated buyers do. As a buyer, you get your paper, right? You give up a massive, massive advantage as a buyer if you allow the seller to uh, to dictate the documents because they're going to anchor the negotiations in your favor. And then your options are either to rewrite the whole thing and look very aggressive and difficult or take terms that are not going to be in your best interest. And you guys need robust protections. You're making the biggest investment of your life. You need high quality indemnification. And let me, let me see if there's any more questions. I'm going to switch gears, Dunzio. I've got, what, 12 minutes left. The last thing I'm going to talk about for the last 12 minutes, let me see if I can stop the sharing. And then I'm going to pull up a standard asset purchase agreement or, or our standard asset purchase agreement. Again, there's no such thing as standard in um, small business. Let's see some of the online marketplaces like Flippa offer template LOIs and I mean, guys, if you want to enter into a, a template LOI, like that's not as big a deal. Um, but the asset purchase agreement, no. And I'll, and I'll show you why right now. Um, so let me share this on the screen here. Can you guys see the asset purchase agreement? It looks like you can. So we have a very reasonable asset purchase agreement at SMB Law Group. It's 29 pages long. That is not a long purchase agreement. That is considered a fairly short purchase agreement. Anything sub 20 pages, guys, is just not going to give you enough protection. Do I have a regular YouTube channel? I don't. I don't know. if Maybe I should, Joe. Uh, we'll see. Anyways, I'll just talk to YouTube instead of telling my wife about all this business buying stuff all the time. She'll appreciate me having an outlet. Um, um, so the most important thing, guys, in your purchase in your, uh, your asset purchase agreement is the reps and warranties and the indemnity. Okay. And let me explain what this means. When you buy a business, there's just not enough time for you to diligence and ferret out every conceivable risk in the business. You do not have the ability to turn over every stone and find every skeleton in the closet. If you try, you're going to make the seller crazy, right? And you're going to kill the deal, 
right? So there's this delicate dance that you do in due diligence between getting enough information to feel comfortable, but not driving the seller to the point where they don't want to deal with you anymore. And how you overcome that, guys, is you have something in your agreement called reps and warranties of the seller. Okay. They're going to tell us about the business. They're going to make statements about the business. Some of these things are going to be really fundamental to the business, really to the core of what the business is. Like the first one, they're, or, you know, they're properly organized. They're qualified to do business authority that they have the full authority to sell you the business. They own it and they can sell it to you that the business, that the, the sale isn't going to conflict with anything major contra contracts any laws, um, anything that they know about that you don't, that they have title to all the assets, that the assets are sufficient to run the business. Again, you're buying a group of assets that are supposed to result when you put them together and you operate them in a certain amount of revenue. If that turns out to not be true, that's a problem. They're going to tell you that the financial statements that they're giving you are correct, true and correct in all material respects and accurately reflect, fairly present um, the financial position of the business, that there aren't any undisclosed liabilities. You know, the credit cards I mentioned earlier, that they're not running 60,000 bucks and stuff that should be on the P&L off to the side and, you know, that you don't know about it, that there hasn't been any changes in the business since the last uh, financial statement that they give you, that they're in compliant with laws and permits, that there isn't any litigation. I'm going to start going faster. Employee benefit stuff labor stuff, tax stuff, environmental law stuff, very important. Even if you're not buying real estate, environmental law stuff is a very important uh, thing to have covered off. Material contracts, you know, that they've given you all the important contracts in the business, that there aren't any related party transactions, you know, that you don't find out that, hey, all this revenue actually turns out to be a business that you separately own, that it's, you know, related. And now I'm not going to get the benefit of it going forward that there aren't any broker commissions that they've agreed to pay that are going to come back on you where that broker comes after you and a bunch of other stuff like inventory, you know, suppliers, personnel, their insurance, so on and so forth. This is them telling you about the business. Buyers and sellers get frustrated about the reps and warranties and how much time that, um, that um, lawyers spend on this. But I'll tell you, there's nothing more important in the purchase agreement than this because your only means of protecting yourself post-closing, your only real means of doing that is through what's called the indemnity provision, okay? And the indemnity is a contractual dispute. Oh, what did I do there? Hold on, let me jump back to it. It's a contractual dispute resolution mechanism. The point is, guys, you do not want to end up in court. If you end up in court and you have to sue the seller for anything, that is going to be so unbelievably expensive. It's not a good thing. So we try to avoid it. We put in place indemnity. And the most important part of the indemnity is that the seller is going to indemnify you for any breaches of the representations and warranties that they made in the agreement or any ancillary agreement. Meaning all those statements that they made up above, if they turn out to not be true, right? Like the one about them owning the business. If it turns out that Aunt Sally actually owns 25% of the business, you think you're buying a hundred of it, you buy it. And then Aunt Sally sues you and says, no, you don't own a hundred percent of that. I own 25%. You can now seek indemnity against the seller for those losses. If you didn't have those statements in the document, and if you don't have this indemnity provision in place, and you think you're buying a hundred percent of it, the only thing you can do is separately sue the seller for breach of, of, um, it can mean that they cover legal expenses and the, my lawn care guy is now using a blower. So sorry about that. Um, it, 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 it can mean that they cover if you get to it, right? But you don't want to get to legal costs. You want to go get indemnity in court if you have to for this. But you set aside money either through the promissory note or an escrow to backstop the indemnity. So if they breach the indemnity, you should be able to go recover against an in our form agreement, you've got the right to set off against the promissory note, meaning you can deem the principal amount of the promissory note reduced by the indemnity claim. So if she owns 25% of the business and 
that turns out to be true, you can go wipe out the promissory note as a result of it and recover that way. If you don't have anything there to support the indemnity, the indemnity is worthless and you got to go to court. And so you may as well throw the whole thing out. Although it does create the means to support your litigation even, right? Uh, if you don't have the, these avenues in your document, then you've got to go make a breach of contract claim, which is incredibly challenging. So any good seller's lawyer is going to spend a lot of time fighting us on this. And it's going to be a little frustrating for you guys. But, you know, if it turns out that they say up above that, hey, there's no lawsuits against the business, and it turns out there actually is a $10 million lawsuit against the business, and you don't have indemnity for it, and if somehow that flows through, and it probably doesn't in an, in an asset deal, you're probably okay. Um, but if it's a stock deal, for example, and there's a $10 million lawsuit, you're in really big trouble. Your investment can go to zero. Uh, and so this is an area you're going to want to spend time on. We have four minutes left, uh, according to, to, to Nunzio. So let me read some of these, these questions. And if you guys want to connect with me separately afterwards, again, it's, it's at SMB small, medium business underscore attorney on Twitter. I'm going to put that in, um, uh, in the notes right now. And then my email is also eric at smblaw.group. Feel free to email me if you guys have any questions. Always happy to connect uh, to talk about business buying. Um, let me read some of these questions, though, and feel free to fire away if you guys have more. So it says, whenever someone is against the mechanism, which that yeah, that's a red flag, right? There will be a lot of opportunities to, to ferret out red flags in your transaction. If they're fighting you tooth and nail over the non-compete, guys, like, just don't compete with me. Right. Like you don't need to fight me on the non-compete trying to carve that up or push back and say 75 miles instead of 100 miles. Like there are sellers out there, guys, that if you give them 50 miles, they'll go to the 51st mile and start competing. And then as soon as that time limit um, expires, guess what they're doing? They're coming right back into the territory to compete with you. So buy a good business from a good person. Um, do, 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 do purchase agreement. Yeah. I mean, listen, if you're making it, you make judgment calls on what level of purchase agreement or whatever you need, but man, if I'm putting even a million, but I don't know any Elliot Holland always says I, he doesn't know anybody who has a million bucks to lose. And I agree with that, man. If, if I'm making a million dollar investment, I got two little kids, I got a one and a four year old. Like I, I can't do that without a high degree of confidence that I've got protections. How do you determine the allocation of the purchase price? That's done by accountants. You are, it's a little bit of a dance. It should all relate back to the fair market value of the assets. Reps and warranty insurance is great. It's really difficult, sub $25 million. Um, what else? I do not have a YouTube channel. Um, I posted on Twitter earlier though, and I said, what should I tell you guys? And let's see what people people have chimed in and said here since we have one more minute nunzio and i we have 24 comments so let's see what they say clint fiore says tell them to have money so you need to have money to buy a business thanks clint uh matt margolis who's a lawyer out of south florida said create a written handbook after acquiring the business that's good lawyerly advice not often um taken in smb uh, lots of vague comments about silver tsunami guys. There is $7 trillion of baby boomer businesses that are set to be bought and sold by 2030. Ride the wave silver tsunami. Um, uh, apprenticing. Yeah. You can always apprentice at a business, uh, beforehand to do, 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 do buy low, sell high. That's good advice. Um, stop obsessing over multiples and obsess on how you're going to increase the net operating income. Start with a joke. Uh, okay. Well, let's end with a joke guys. Um, what do you call 10,000 lawyers at the bottom of a lake? Anybody? It's a good start. So I'll conclude on that. Nunzio, thanks for having me as a part of the presentation. Um, again, guys, SMB attorney on Twitter. Eric at smblaw.group. If there's ever anything I could do to be supportive of you guys in your uh, transaction or in your life, let me know. I'm always happy to do it and um, enjoy the rest of the